be seated. I found myself wondering just then what would happen if I didn't invite you to be seated. Would you have stood through the whole sermon? Could have been terrible. Um, It's summer, and for that I am thankful because we have this little story. In the middle of summer, this brief and seemingly simple little story, our brains are so thankful. Mary and Martha in five verses, I can handle that. That is as much as I can handle. So let's just refresh ourselves. While traveling, Jesus enters a village and he approaches the home of a, of a woman named Martha. She warmly opens the door and welcomes him as her guest. And Jesus makes himself right at home. He sits and he speaks, sharing himself and his message. Martha's sister Mary follows him to his place and sits at his feet. She finds herself listening to every single thing he has to say. And meanwhile, Martha is in the kitchen getting everything ready for the meal. She finds herself isolated, hungry for companionship, stuck laboring through tasks, working herself into a state of anxious distraction over the meal, the perfect meal that she has envisioned for her guest. It's sort of fun to imagine poor Martha in the kitchen. I picture her with a little attitude, sighing heavily, grunting through her tasks, exaggerating all of her effort, banging pots a little louder than she needs to, dropping plates on the table with a little heavier thump than she might normally, more banging and clanging than is absolutely necessary, as if the noise that she might be making in the kitchen could maybe startle her sister Mary out of this trance and into the kitchen to help. And it's possible that my imagination is so vivid and clear here because I have been on the receiving end of this treatment. My mom was a champ at these efforts, at these sorts of hints. When I was a kid, I had a way of just plopping down and sinking into the couch right in front of the TV in our family room, and our family room opened up to our kitchen, and my mom, who was a giver and a doer and a servant to her friends and her family, a generous spirit and a devoted person to making the people in her life happy, she both worked to financially support our family and kept our house in perfect order, so she couldn't let me lazy my way through when she was working herself to the absolute limit. I can't possibly blame her now. (laughs) My disregard had to be addressed. So it's as if she had timed her work in the kitchen to line up with my lounging, and I would be so angry at her for how loudly she would both load and remove the dishes from the dishwasher. It's like she put the dishwasher on some sort of setting that made it groan even louder, and she put the dishes away loudly and closed the cabinets loudly. She'd drop things into the sink loudly, and they would clang loudly, and she'd run the water at full blast. Every single move was exaggerated, bigger than it needed to be, and then she'd start to vacuum. (laughs) Ugh. She always had to start right under my feet, you know? And so there she was, without a doubt, confirmed by a phone call we had this week, trying to draw my attention to my own laziness, and it worked. I realized quite clearly how lazy I was being, but I kept my eyes glued to the TV. Even if I couldn't hear the show anymore, it didn't matter because we were in a standoff. (laughs) And to be perfectly honest, I have since been on the giving end of this treatment. Every roommate I have had, and certainly poor sweet Michael, have endured my deep sighs my huffing and my heavy-footed stepping and my clanging, all to make a point that I'm feeling very sorry for myself because I am so busy that all of these people should care about the thing that I care about as much as I care about it at the moment that I care. I shouldn't have to ask for help because you should want to help me right now in this very moment. Martha's sister Mary was different, though. She wasn't being lazy or defiant. They weren't in a standoff because Mary doesn't even know she's participating. Mary didn't even receive the hints. She simply couldn't be bothered. 
She is so fully enjoying the excitement of the time she's sharing with Jesus that nothing could pull her attention away. Mary is in the zone. There's no telling how long she had been sitting at Jesus' feet when Martha finally reaches her limit. The threshold of her patience was met and she finally broke, clearly exasperated by her sister's complete disregard for her effort, annoyed that Mary has not even bothered to half-heartedly offer her assistance, and overwhelmed by all there is to do, Martha pushes her way into the conversation. She presumably interrupts Jesus to see if he has noticed Mary's laziness, to ask if he cared at all about the injustice of this scene. Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to prepare the table all by myself? Tell her to help me. She wants him to back her up, and she thinks she's right. She thinks he's going to. She wants him to send Mary to the kitchen to share the workload. She wants him to pause his storytelling for just one minute until the meal is ready so that everyone can enjoy it together later. But Jesus does not do what Martha wants at all. Instead, Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things, but one thing is necessary— Mary has chosen the better part. Other translations of this passage uh, make Jesus' response referring to Martha's anxiety. He calls her anxious and troubled and upset and worked up and even fussing. No matter the translation, the message has to sting. No one likes being told that they're wrong. And it's not really as much that Martha was wrong as it was that Mary was more right, which for siblings is basically the same thing. (laughs) So at first glance, it really does seem that Jesus is reprimanding Martha, and many sermons have been preached based on that first glance. Poor Martha has been ridiculed endlessly for her behavior and her attitude. And while most of us are in this room here, self-consciously relating to Martha, preachers everywhere have condemned her for being a tattletale, a worrywart, and an anxious presence for her guest. You don't want to be like Martha, they say. Find the peace of Mary in a world that tells you to be like Martha. Resist the Martha. Be like Mary. But Jesus doesn't seem to be dismissing her the way we so often have. He seems to be reaching out to her. Martha, Martha, speaking her name twice, he begins to calm this overwhelmed host. Martha, Martha, I'm grateful for the way that Jesus cares for her. He's patient with her. He's understanding. He knows that all of her worry and distraction comes from a place of sweet love. It's just a little out of place in this particular situation. And I'm grateful for the way that Jesus cares for her because as I hear Jesus speak to Martha, it is if he is speaking to me. Casey, Casey, you are so worried and distracted by many things, but one thing is necessary— Choose the better part. If I had been in Martha's position, I think I would have been tempted to just respond, I know that one thing is necessary. I know that devotion to you is the one thing. I know that you deserve my whole self, my undivided attention, but day by day, it feels like so many things are necessary, not just one thing. Stuff has to get done. People are counting on me. You're right. I'm worried and I'm distracted, but my spirit is anxious either way. My spirit is anxious when I realize I haven't taken time to rest in your presence, and my spirit is anxious when I do take time to rest. We feel guilty either way, don't we? Guilty for not taking the time to nurture our relationship with God, and also guilty for taking the time away from our responsibilities to delight in God. We think we can't have it all, that no matter what, we're going to miss out on something. Some part of our lives is going to suffer. If we don't miss a detail, a meeting, or a responsibility, then we'll miss an opportunity to follow Jesus where we are being led, and vice versa. Our Christian disciple selves feel at odds with our achieving modern American selves. But I think maybe we can have it all, and I think we can because I knew my great-grandmother. I have to tell you this because it's going to be relevant in a second. I called her Paz Mama. 
and uh, because that's what my mom called her. But we, we called my grandfather Pa, so it worked out nicely that Pa's mom was Pa's mama, Pa's mama. That was her name. So Pa's mama was the epitome of a southern grandma. She lived out in the country on a lot of land uh, in middle to east Tennessee. She had a kitchen and a living room with a really low ceiling and this hodgepodge of chairs and the porch was big and had a nice breeze. There was a place for everyone in our extended family to pull up a seat and sit down, take your pick, inside or outside. And Pa's mama was strong. She picked beans and pulled apples off the trees. She took care of the house. She cooked hearty meals for her kids and grandkids and great grandkids. She worked odd jobs her whole life. She was a volunteer at the local hospital in Cookville, Tennessee, but not just any volunteer. She had more volunteer hours than anyone in the history of the hospital. She sounds like a Martha, doesn't she? Not so fast. The green beans she picked had to be snapped and jarred, and the apples she picked had to be cut to make apple pie because she was a southern grandma. And there was no reason for her to do that alone, ever. So our family would gather on the porch and we would sit at her feet and she taught us how to snap beans and she told us stories about the old days and she listened to our chatter and she soaked up her family. And the meals she cooked and the cleaning of the house never interfered with enjoying her people. Somehow or another, dinner was always ready as soon as the last person arrived. And she would rope in people in the kitchen to help finish the details teaching along the way. And her volunteer position at the hospital was not just about collecting hours or staying busy after her sons were grown. She loved and knew the staff there, and they loved and admired her. She knew people. She remembered their stories story, she was a saint and a hero, and so now she kind of sounds like a Mary, doesn't she? She had the intensity of Martha in the sensitivity of Mary. She was driven, but she was also delighting. She made people feel loved through food, but most of all by her focus. It was her attention that made you feel deeply loved. Pa's mama was never too worried, never too distracted to spend time with her family, to gather us around and enjoy our love. The things that kept Pa's mama busy weren't distracting because they never dragged her focus completely away from her loves long enough to burden her. The danger for us is when we become distracted by the details, tired by the tasks, rattled by our responsibilities. Poor Martha was worried and she was distracted She didn't let herself look up from her work long enough to realize that she really was missing out on the one thing that mattered. She was so worried about the meal coming together, so distracted by her jobs, that she didn't have a chance to give Jesus any of her focus. She was blinded by her responsibility, so much so that she couldn't recognize the significance of the presence of the Lord in her own living room. Martha was so worked up about the chores and Mary's behavior that she could not enjoy the presence of the Lord in her home. He was in her home, and she was missing it. He was in her home, and she couldn't see long enough to slow down and enjoy. How often have we failed to see and hear God's mercy and grace and love because we were too distracted? We are hungry to know God's forgiving mercy. We are desperate to be swept up into God's inviting grace. We are longing to realize God's liberating love. We want to be fully tuned into God's presence and movement in our lives, but we find ourselves too distracted. We're distracted by responsibility at work and at home, by frustrations with loved ones and neighbors and strangers. We're even distracted by phones that capture our attention when our minds and hands are otherwise idle, and all of these things add to our worry. We are worried and we are distracted. So we are invited to trade in our worry and distraction and make Jesus Christ the one thing. He invited Martha, and he invites us to do the same. We get to invite Jesus to be the object of our focus and the purpose of our lives. We welcome Jesus into our distracted minds and worried hearts. We sing again the words of the great hymn, Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord. Lead me home. 
Let's renew our focus today. Turn your eyes onto Jesus. Tune your ears to hear his message. In the midst of your busyness, find peace in the presence of the one thing. When our focus turns to the one thing, we will realize Jesus Christ is in our midst, maybe even in our own living rooms. We will see the face of Christ in neighbors who frustrate us. We will fully be present with our family and our friends. We will recognize the way that God's kingdom is coming near. We will truly be God's people in the world. When we focus on the one thing, then all our other things will have purpose. Our trouble will find peace. Jesus is among you. God's spirit goes with you. Don't miss it because you are worried and distracted. There is one thing. Jesus Christ, in all that you must do and all that you choose to do, may your focus be the one thing. Amen.